Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Wealth of Geeks Movies, Money, and More podcast. Welcome to the Wealth of Geeks Movies, Money, and More podcast, where entertainment and finance collide. Join us as we bring together people each episode to debate the hottest topics in the world of entertainment and finance. So, whether you're a fan of Star Wars or side hustles, Marvel or money, this podcast has got you covered. And now, here's your host. I am your host, Sarah Gilliland, and I am very excited today to talk about the more portion of the Wealth of Geeks, Movies, Money, and More podcast because a lot of times we spend time talking about movies and money but we don't spend enough time talking about more which really encompasses all the other subjects we talk about at our website wealthofgeeks.com but before I get into exactly what we are talking about today I want to introduce my two guests for those of you who have been with us since the beginning of the podcast you may recognize Gareth Noonan. He is our resident UK specialist live from his bunker somewhere in Wales. <laughs> he is a freelance entertainment journalist with bylines in major print and online publications, which include Wealth of Geeks. Thank you for being here with us again, Gareth. Great to be here. Excited about this subject. We're talking about something new today. But before I do that, we are going to also introduce Alexa Markovic. Markov- Did I get it? Sort of. <laughs> yeah, you did great. You guys have such interesting last names that I just butcher them and with my American accent. So I apologize. <laughs> you did great. Well, thank you. But um, Alexa is new on the podcast, so everyone treat him gently. <laughs> he is from Montenegro. He is a law graduate who is currently on his criminal law master studies, which impressive. Very good. Um, He has a lot of things that he loves, including gaming, automobiles, cooking, traveling, and so on. But probably the biggest thing you need to know about him is that he is working on some upcoming projects for Wealth of Geeks, which I'm going to keep my lips closed about because we don't know about, we haven't announced that yet. So I'll just, but you'll be seeing his name a lot more. He also does travel writing for Wealth of Geeks. So thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. I have a great travel editor. Ah, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> you look, flattery is not going to give you points in this because I'm going to be fair and just when it comes to picking a winner of the debate. <laughs> oh, we, we picked a winner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you didn't know? Oh. oh, yes. Someone has to win and someone has to lose in this debate. <laughs> all right. Gareth knows all about that, don't you? Yep. <laughs> He had to take on Kyle Logan, who is pretty intense when it comes to his support of or support or dismantling of different topics. But oh, I, I'm I'm going to be completely neutral today to start with because I don't know much about video games. I, as we discussed before we started recording, I pretty pretty much play Mario games. I've into Mario Kart, Super Nintendo back in the day. But you guys wanted to talk about Assassin's Creed. So, Gareth, I want to hear about why you love Assassin's Creed. What? Why did you guys focus on this particular video game? Because uh, it's a kind of a strange microcosm of sort of the state of the games industry in a lot of ways and has been for years. It was one of the first games that probably shouldn't have gone yearly that did. And Ubisoft have this fantastic habit of just kind of throwing all kinds of ideas into a pot when it comes to Assassin's Creed. I mean, initially it was meant to be a trilogy of game, um, heavily focused on history, and although it still is, and there's not a lot of other games that bother looking at things historically, which is another reason why I love the series, um, and not just because I'm an annoying Brit who likes wandering around Winchester, where I used to work for a bit. Um, uh, but yeah, with, you know, Assassin's Creed is, is a really interesting sort of world and experience and it's all vaguely based on historical fact as far as anything that says it's based on a true story and that's that's kind of why i love assassin's creed lexa what do you love about assassin's creed well you have to you have to understand you know that the primary thing i I come from let's say poor country and the first assassin's creed was out in 2007 so as a poor country we didn't have like top top of the art, you know, PCs and stuff. And uh, we usually, you know, stuck around uh, about some, you know, low quality games. And when it was first released in 2007, uh, the first Assassin's Creed game, it was incredibly light. 
even on some, let's say, dated PCs. I mean, you couldn't play it in like you know, high graphics and stuff, but it was something, you know, completely new. You had a first person, you, you went into history, it was Middle East, like Persia and, and stuff. You, you were fighting with swords, killing Templars, you know, you, you, the game is completely immersive. And um, I have to disagree with Garrett. Uh, I think uh, before they, I mean, I know I started disagreeing right right away. But no, I, we're, we're five minutes in and you're already disagreeing. <laughs> no, he, he is right. But initially, 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 it, the Assassin's Creed game was actually, you know, produced as some kind of sequel to Prince of Persia. And they only intended to to make one game. like, But, you know, it snowballed. Uh, it snowballed in because the, the reactions were huge and that was back in the day when Ubisoft were innovative in a good way and not trying to, you know, change for, you know, for the sake of change, you know, because, okay, we did something uh, for long, we have to change it because, you know, we have to change it. Back then, they, they did, you know, great innovative stuff and the first game, I have a different opinion now on it because, you know, the, the next games were much better, but... For the time being, when it was released, it was something that me personally, Garrett is a lot older than me, and but for for me, something you know, a lot, <laughs> and I don't think a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you look beautiful. You look great. <laughs> oh, I thought that you're a teenager, <laughs> looking great. No, just just uh, saying, you know. For for me personally, when it was released, it was complete shift, you know, from playing solitaire or or you know pinball on on your you know M Microsoft XP to, to you know something. Oh, wow, like this is happening. Okay, so Gareth, you know, he's Alexis talked a lot about how he played it first on his computer. Is that where you spend most of your time playing this game, or do you play it on Xbox, PlayStation, something like that? Um, I had the first lot on the Xbox 360. Um, I remember wandering into Blockbusters and picking it up. <laughs> it, was, it was like second hand and I was like, Look. there was a lot of talk about it, but it was like, it's got some good ideas. Blah. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> but, um, I was always a massive fan of the Prince of Persia games growing up. So, you know, Ubisoft make another game based in the Middle East that sounds interesting. A really interesting time to actually hit, like, a Muslim hero, almost. Because, you know, it was, what, 2007. All of the stuff was still kicking off in the Middle East. And here we have the French company releasing a game where you are essentially playing... Um, somebody in a Middle Eastern Muslim sect and he's the hero of the game. So yeah, I had to, I had to go. <laughs> but w w w was Altair Muslim? I, I think, you know, first, uh, first Assassin's Creed was, was it set in BC? Like if we are talking about the, the religion, it, it, it became, you know, when Prophet Muhammad uh, went from Mecca to Medina in third, fourth, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, after Michael was born in I think a sense in like ten twenty seven or something. It's like the height of the Crusades. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you you might be right. You might be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. My... So once they has gone through the Crusades essentially in this first game, because I know you guys have said there are there are more versions of it and we'll we'll get to all of the different ones in a little bit, but um, where do you go? Where does the storyline go from there? I mean, I know once you kind of get done playing, you're done. But you said, Gareth, you said that they started out making a trilogy of these. But, and, you know, obviously it has continued because it's still relevant. <laughs> yeah, the um, the sort of the main through line of the game is this idea of um, like trace memory within, say, somebody's like DNA line. So... Um, this company called Abstergo comes up with a machine that basically lets you relive the tales of your ancestors, if you will. So obviously it starts with this guy called Altair, and then as his lineage goes on, 
it goes to different parts of the world as obviously people move about and your family tree broadens so in assassin's creed one it was out here in the middle east and then it was at Seattle, I think it's in Auditori. In, Auditori. Yeah. Sapire. In Italy. Different. <laughs> so you're doing all the, the stuff about the um, sort of city, city states in Italy. And he proved to be such a popular character that he got like two sequels just of his own. Um, and then they did the American Revolution, which wasn't as good. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. Like, it was. I feel like I need an American voice on here to to say whether or not it was actually good or bad. <laughs> no, I mean the story, the story of the third one, which you know we will we will come to that. But it felt forced, like you know they did you know like a Muslim character, they did Italian Renaissance character, and uh, Ezio, w- which was the star of the second uh, uh, second game installment and uh, its sequels. It it. It uh, brought so much popularity. It still thought to be the best, and I feel like somewhere in the HQ, uh, someone said, "Okay, guys, but we need like our hero." And it was uh, they they tried to incorporate like he was Native American. Uh, it, it's relevant to the story later on the fourth on the fourth game and stuff, but it just felt forced like the whole gameplay the whole story for me it felt so forced i did not enjoy playing it but you know like i downloaded it and uh, like okay i have to go through it it can't be that bad it can't be but it's like it's not only that the game is different i mean they could not have changed you know billions of stuff like the 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 gameplay and stuff it's 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 the same and mechanics and the battles and stuff but just the, the 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 that like harmony was lost. The aura is different. You know, you go from Renaissance Italy, a uh, buildings. You know, uh, I don't know the name of the great that beautiful building in Florence, but you know, you go from Rome, uh, Istanbul, Colosseum, Hagia Sophia, Bosphorus. You go to the woods in you know newly found continent. You like climb the trees. Everything is so dark. Everything is so like. It's it's it almost felt depressing, like you know, it's behind you. It's so I I did not You're saying America was boring at that point. <laughs> no, but if you compare it, if you compare it, Here it says, yeah. God, I mean, if, if you wanna if you wanna look, look like that, you know, the Africa wasn't very popular as well. I mean, if you compare it to you know Renaissance Italy, because you know everything everything happened. Rome Rome is like eternal city. Rome is older than a Christ and. You know, everything was happening in Italy, in Rome, and later, you know, with with the shift of the Roman Empire to that, at that time, it wasn't called Istanbul, it was Constantinople, um, but uh, the Byzantine Empire, so, you know, you had everything, like, you could climb the roofs, buildings, you know, cities, and in the third installment, you just had a forest, and, you know, like, you ride your horse, 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 for 20 minutes, you're riding the horse, then you find a little cabin, you know, there is nothing in it. It's just a cabin. And then you ride your horse for 20 minutes and so on. So it's just, you know, it's just come on. You know, I was like drinking Coca-Cola and pressing my finger on W, you know, like he's running. Okay. What's going on, mom? You know, like. <laughs> and saying that, I think the problem with. Challenging. Mentally. The problem with three is that it kind of lost the verticality that the rest of it was because a lot of the earlier games, a massive part of it was how you could climb buildings and like do parkour, but yeah, and and clamber around stuff. And Boston in whichever century it is, uh, not not a lot of high rises there or or much what things. Point? There's the occasional boat that was probably the best part of it. Yeah, they introduced like the boat stuff, which became a massive part of four. Yeah, which was all about running around the Caribbean as a pirate, as a a Welsh pirate, I have to say. And <laughs> it was English. No, I actually Welsh. Really, I oh, I was getting that. Yeah. Ryan, what's the state? Slouch. There is a definite distinction. <laughs> the UK is made up of four different countries. People keep to, seem to forget that. <laughs> I get geography in high school. My son is English. 
I mean, if, yeah, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I know like that those, when somebody says like that, it rustles your jimmies, you know, like for <laughs> Englishmen and Scotsmen and Welsh, you know, like it's Welsh. So I'm, you know, just kidding. But I, I actually cannot distinct, you know, be, between, you know, apart, apart from, you know, language, but visually I cannot. But yeah, talking, talking about, you know, first one and just reverting to, to Sarah's question, like, um, they, maybe they did not intend to continue it, but still there was like a gap to be filled because it left so much open at the end of the first one. I mean, the ending is great. You learn about supernatural artifacts. Uh, you are betrayed by your teacher, mentor. Well, what was he? He's like a Templar leader. You, he says that everything you've been taught uh, was a lie. He's a Templar and so on and so on. And, you know, it just left them with so much open space, you know, for, for growth because, and there is so much race, you know, you can, you can continue, you can continue with Altair, maybe his new travels, you can, you know, there are so many stuff you can do and they, they boldly, they shifted to middle, middle, uh, middle age, Italy, you know, Renaissance Italy. And, you know, they, they hit the home run with that. It was a massive, massive success. It was like, to this day, for me, like second and fourth part of, of Assassin's Creed are the, the best. Gareth, do you have any opinions on which ones are the best? <laughs> uh, the second and the fourth one. <laughs> Two and four, we agree on that. But. Okay, I think we will probably. I'm just finding, you know, material to talk. Okay, let's talk about the installments of the second one. You know, so you know, Rome and Istanbul. What are your opinions on that? Hey, they were all right, but they were just more of the same, with like extra bits bolted on the sides. It was very much a sort of Stacy's new hat situation. But that's what made them great, you know. You know that if if they if they stuck around, you know, with more of the same. For me, you know, it was so familiar. You know, you're going from you know from Ezio, who is like 18 in the in the you know first part of the of the second installment. He is like 18. Then you know uh, in the second part, I think it's called Brotherhood. He is you know in Rome. He is like in his mid 40s. He's more experienced. You know, it's the same guy. You are growing. You know, old with him. And then uh, in the last part, you have Istanbul. He's like in his 50s, 60s. And on the end, it, it's called Revelations. I, In the end of it, he dies like an old man on a bench. So you have like a whole span, you know, whole lifetime of one character, you know, in three games. And for me, that's what, you know, like made it great. It's like so familiar. It's the same guy, new buildings, new stuff, new cities, you know, like that they, they, they kept everything that I liked from original second and that's for me that's why why I enjoyed them so much I, yeah I could I could see that actually like it, it's nice to actually have a character that you stick with and that's probably why I really like the Yakuza games because they have a similar stint because you're you're following this one guy in this one town really um through like decades and and that's it's quite nice to have like a map where you know where things are and you know who and you know the characters you know what's going on and you're kind of going back into their lives but i think for assassin's creed because of the kind of sort of adventure story that it was the through line wasn't so much Ezio as it was desmond and the problem with that is that they didn't kill Desmond off at the end of the third one. Uh, <laughs> and it just kind of lost its its way a bit. But it... Hmm, trying to find my thought again. Um, it, it kind of had a kind of completeness to it, I think. By the end of Revelations, it felt like the series should have stopped. Or at least maybe that's it. Right, right. What a kind of uh, that was my feeling to it. But definitely at the time when they then announced free, I was like, "What are we?" I thought, I thought... <laughs> yeah, but without free, we wouldn't have the fourth. Well, yeah, we would have 
whatever it's called, skull and bones, which has been delayed and delayed and delayed. Yeah. I I know I hear you. You know, constantly you know mentioning Desmond. You know, like out of the animals parts and stuff. Like, what is your opinion, Sarah? I'm taking her role. Like, <laughs> that's just free. I'm just here to facilitate. When you guys run out of questions for each other, I like this. Feel free. Go ahead. <laughs> so you know, you Garrett kept keeps mentioning. You know, like that Desmond part uh, out of the animals parts. I forgot the names of the later ones. For, forgive me, but. The, I, I wanted to know your opinion on it because to me it was like I can live without you know like those parts like I, it to me like it was just you know especially when they're like forced when you like have to get out of the animus and I'm like so immersed in the story I'm you know six to thousand years you know in the past and then like the story forces you to get out of the animus and you're like now in the future and now you're just like walking through the building reading someone's emails and stuff like to me like and you're like oh my god i found something like and you just you know press like e or enter like just read an email and then you like have to read and i'm like okay why just i why wasn't i just shown this like in in game why do i have to read an email inside the game i'm playing a game so i don't have to read email like that's why i'm playing it I don't want to read my emails. Why would I read Desmond's emails? Like, <laughs> so yeah, that part was, I could live without it. Yeah. So I always kind of liked it because it kind of gave everything sort of weird sense of continuity because the, the main character wasn't actually the guys in the animus. It was this schlub who was a bartender who gets kidnapped. <laughs> By the end of it, you know, starts learning about his past and his world and all these other things that are just lying underneath the surface. And I kind of like that side of it. And, um, he wasn't a great character, to be honest, but <laughs> I, don't know, I, I think he was basically supposed to be a cipher for the player, really. And then when they got to four, they were just like, wow, let's just make it some random who works there, who's doing this thing. It seemed a bit more messy at that point because they were definitely some programmers there going, Let's let's make the main character in an overworked and underpaid programmer of a games company. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah that's good. He's, he's really relatable. <laughs> they got a little meta. <laughs> you got a little. They got very. Yeah, fine. but but don't you think it's like it's like too much in there? I mean, I'm I'm like fine, you know, for the story. Okay, how are we returning to past? Okay, there is a guy. He lies in the animus. It was his ancestors and. I'm like fine with that. Okay, they explained to me how are we where we are now. But like, don't you think it's like too much of it, especially when when there are like forced parts. You know, like you have to get out of the animus, and you cannot go back in until you like go through the building. You know, like fully dressed in your jeans and t-shirt, like you know coming from swords and crossbows and stuff. You are like in jeans and you know just. So, so uninteresting, you know, like, just lay back down, turn on the animals, come on, let's go back. <laughs> it does get less as we get on, though. <laughs> to an extent. See, I just liked it. I just, I just thought it, it gave it a, a little bit, is there? Death. Yeah, a little bit of depth, a little bit of alternate stuff to do. And it was quite fun the first time it happened because you were like, da, 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 and then you're like, what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is a game and a game. Very yeah. fun. That's true. It's the, I was going to say, the way you're describing it, it sounds like the inception of video games. <laughs> it pretty much is. Yeah, it's something like that. Before inception. Very true. That's so, another thing we could argue about is how inception is just a game movie. Oh, cool. Yeah. There, there's a That's lot of cool. wing section in it. In it. Yeah. I'll be on my soapbox for a second. Um, uh, kind of shot in a way that's very similar to, to like various parts in video games. Like there's a bit with some snowmobiles, and that's kind of straight out of one of the CODs, I think. One of the Call of Duty games, sorry. Um, but there's a, the, the heist is set up very much like Grand Theft Auto is. It's really weird. Mm -hmm. But I think Chris Nolan is a gamer, so it kind of makes sense. I can imagine so. 
I don't have any proof of that, but I feel like he's probably nerdy enough to be a gamer. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So m- explain a little bit about, or maybe not explain, I guess let's talk about the movie because we need to talk about it. <laughs> because maybe for people like me who don't play Assassin's Creed, but kind of knew about the movie because, I mean, it had a big name star in it, Michael Fassbender. Oh, you're talking mm-hmm. about the Assassin's Creed movie. Yes, the Assassin's Creed movie. <laughs> you both, you both like rolled your eyes and made faces. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm assuming you don't like it, but I think we need to talk about it because it was so, it was the game was so successful I, that they felt like they needed to make a movie out. <laughs> so for me, the movie felt like you know, like a TV commercial that lasted hour and a half, like TV commercial for Assassin's Creed movie. And, you know, like, just goes on and on. Like, they don't want to include spoilers and stuff. So I'm, like, just watching, you know, 90 minutes. Okay, what's going to happen? Now it's going to happen. Anything going to happen? No? Okay, we just end it. Okay, so, so yeah, for for me, just, you know, Michael is a great actor. Really like his, his style and stuff. But so much potential to make that movie. So much material to make that movie especially with the CGI and, you know, today's opportunities and stuff. Like, there is so much opportunity to, to, to make, you know, like, even if they made, like, a movie version of the game, like, with the completely same story, I would watch it. Like, it would be great, you know, like, new cinematics with actors. I would watch it. This, what they made, it just felt, like, you know, completely distant from, from the whole franchise, like, it wasn't Assassin's Creed. That that's like the whole point. It was a movie, but it wasn't Assassin's Creed movie. Excuse me. <laughs> I saw it in the cinema, and I can't for the life of me remember what happened in half of it. That is how much of an impact it had on me. Did it? Like it was just. I think it was one of those films where it was just like it just attacked you with like random set pieces and. I think they did something to the to like the to try and make everything look cooler and hip and more, you know, the usual kind of stuff that goes terribly wrong when film execs think that they know better than, you know, the source material, which has been the problem with most video game adaptations for time and memorial, to be honest. Um. So, yeah, at the end of it, like you know, it was like Michael Fassbender. That's cool. They were like, okay, it ties into the stuff that they did in... I think it was tied into Assassin's Creed 2, vaguely. Because I think the stuff in the past was in Italy or somewhere. It might be in Spain. But it was that kind of... I can't like, even remember. Euro. Like, it was so irrelevant. I just... <laughs> but I had a thought. Really? I had a thought, like, when you were talking, you gave me an inspiration. Because when we talk about Assassin's Creed movie, it's like all cinematics... No story, like great graphics, great costumes. And then we can like shift that to new Assassin's Creed games. Like <laughs> it's so cinematic, it's so, but it's so boring, like, you know, just just feels, you know, like, like that. Like graphics are great, my PC can't run it, you know, like you need to full equipment, you need, you know, to buy a game for a hundred bucks and stuff. You know, like, and you do get great graphics, you know, you can see the, the pores on their faces. It's so great. And yet it's so boring. Like, it, it's so <laughs> un- unplayable. <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. In preparation for this, I actually gave um, was it Assassin's Creed Origins an go. And I didn't mind that, but that was mostly because it was quite fun wandering around Egypt. You know, like the height of the skin, which um, I think it was Ptolemy, one of the earlier theories anyway. And and that was quite interesting because you had that and then they kind of add these in bits about how they actually have lots of like trading relationships with the Greeks and that they share stuff with the Romans. That part was interesting. But the actual gameplay was very much get on your camel, go to this cave, kill this man, get back on your camel, find the next game. <laughs> that was the game. <laughs> they see free remastered, basically. I, I the, that, the, the, the Origins is like the only one of the newer ones where I 
could handle the story, like especially with the Caesar at the end and stuff, you know, like for me, yeah. you know, I studied Roman law and all their lives and stuff, you know, like, okay, it was, you know, like re relatable. But uh, apart from that, uh, I'm sure you will have some comments on the new, new combat system, like, uh, what's going on there? I mean, like it's 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 like a Medal of Honor or something like completely, you know, like WWE. It's not Assassin's Creed, like. <laughs> I think it, like when you start playing, you get a feeling somebody played Dark Souls and was like, "Yeah, we'll do that," because it, it's very much you know, block, parry, stab, and then the the world design just feels like The Witcher. And it's just got a load of everybody else. It feels like it's got a lot of everyone else's ideas, but none of its own. And, and I think that's what kind of characterizes a lot of like Ubisoft's output over the last, I would say, decade. Yep. Because the same thing happened to Far Cry, where it was just like a mishmash of what was what, what other people were doing well and just throwing it in a pot. And then just adding so much onto it that you've got this hundred hour bloated mess of a game that you're just never going to get through. Okay. Yeah. And then they did it for three years in a row and we're wondering why people... Well, I, th th I think you're, you're actually onto something because the new Assassin's Creed games feel like Ubisoft took every their successful game, stick it, you know, like in, in some, you know, past, in past time, you know, like... Uh, the area and then and, and timeline and just in, in that, you know, mashup, they just, you know, completely lost Assassin's Creed. Like every game is in there, but there is just no Assassin's Creed. Like the map is great. The, 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 the graphics are great. You know, uh, you know, Egypt, Greek, uh, I did not like the, 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 the Valhalla, the Viking ones. It just, it was too distant for me. But anyways, like apart from, from that, uh, there is nothing that, you know, can tie me to Ezio or Altair or Edward. It just, it was, it was a different game, you know, like, and yeah. if, if they renamed it, like, I don't know, Egypt style or something, you know, Odyssey, just Odyssey without Assassin's Creed, I, you know, I could maybe understand it. It would still be boring, but uh, I could be, you know, like, maybe more personally attached to it. This yeah. way, when I know it's Assassin's Creed game, you know, you're ruining, you are ruining it for me. Like, please, just, mm -hmm. you know, like, stop. Remaster the old ones, you know, just do something, remaster the first one because it's repetitive, it's boring after you, you know, play the second one, everything is the same. Remaster it, make it a bit more interesting for, for you know, original gamers and, you know, like, just stop. Stop what you're doing. It's not working, stop. <laughs> Yeah. So, how many versions of Assassin's Creed games are there? Uh, can we do we count, you know, like sequels and stuff like Rogue and, you know, it's it's like a lot. I mean, you, you had that Freedom Cry. Is it Freedom Cry when you play as as a Devale Chronicles in China? I want to say it's at least 15. Yeah, definitely at least 15, but they're not like all the main ones. You have are like... They're, a, are they not all related to each other? No, they are related, but like you had like main ones, which was, you know, like first, second, third, and so on. But you had like on the second one, you had two sequels. On the fourth one, you had uh, two or three sequels because you you had that that uh, liberty... Is it liberty? Liberation. Uh, when you play, uh, the liberation, I think was a when the, you play as a woman in 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 like uh, Boston or or somewhere in there. Yeah, that was the PS5 one. No, I played it on the PC as well. Yeah, yeah, they released it later on to make like, up money. But so you know, like you have uh, main ones, but also uh, almost every one of those those main ones has its sequels. So if you start counting, you will like never it's never ending because <laughs> there is also uh, not everyone uh, not every single one is released for pc i think that the chinese one is it chronicles it was not released for pc am i am i wrong am i wrong i don't know because i only played them on the console so. <laughs> so if somebody was interested in playing assassin's creed like me maybe and had never played before 
what what do you start with? Oh, you start with the first one. I mean, you have to, because of the story. I mean, it it's still Assassin's Creed, and you know, it's the story is connected, and you have to start with the first one. Like, it's same like with the Star Wars. You need to watch, you know, like the prequels, even if you don't like maybe the first one. You have to watch it because of the story. But <laughs> I like the third one. I like the fourth one. You just watch four, five, and six, and then sadly George Lucas died in a plane crash. I still know. I like the third one. I like you know General Grievous and stuff like Anakin story. I like the third one too. Oh yes. My my favorite though is probably Rogue One, but that's that's another podcast. Episode. Yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> it's so great. So, so you start with the first one, obviously, but then where do you go from there? Do you continue to follow the storyline or is it okay to jump around or people going to get confused if they pick up? I wouldn't jump around. I would just, you know, like stick to it because, um, the story itself in the game is not connected. Like, uh, in, in the terms of you start in 11th century, then you go to 12th, then you go to 13th. It's not like that, you know, like. You jumped from 11th century to 15th, 16th, but the 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 progression of the game and some supernatural artifacts and stuff, you know, I think it's the best, you know, if if you continue the the route of of their release. But after the fifth one, I'm sure you will just stop like playing. You will just fifth, sixth one, you you will get enough. You will probably re revert to playing the the, the old ones. <laughs> so so avoid all of the new ones that have come out in the last few years i did not like them i, I maybe it's just not for me but you know I, they have their audience that's for sure i mean uh, everything has has its audience but uh, i think that their audience is uh, younger kids who probably did not have time you know to to play the older ones you know, like when we were younger, like I was in 2007, I was like eight or nine. So, you know, for me, it all started there. For them, like we're talking kids who are, you know, like 11, 12 or maybe nine, you know, now. For them, it probably starts now. Like it's 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 the beginning for them is like the new games. So, you know, they probably won't have the problem with the combat, with the storyline, because they have no reference in it. For them, probably the story will be all oh, so great. But if you take the older ones into reference, for me, they're not, it's not the same game. That, that's what I'm, you know, like trying to say. Mm -hmm. Gareth, what do you um, think? Um, I think that you could probably just call them two separate series almost. But with under the same banner always. Um, so you could probably start with Origins with the new ones because they will kind of follow on to each other in that way, and they're all similar gameplay wise. But if you wanted to play like the originals, you would probably want to start with the first one or maybe the second one because the first one is a pain to find at the moment. But just the just new one that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the only one they never bothered porting to anything else. <laughs> vintage, it's mint. Yeah, what? vintage. I'm twenty-four. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I when I was talking, you know, to to Garrett we, before the the recording started, you know, he he said, you know, I'm gonna get AC Mirage soon. You know, it's uh, it's like the newest one upcoming. You know, and I told him, oh, I just do it like the normal folk. I I, I wait for eight years until it becomes outdated. And uh, I, until I can, you know, buy the PC who can handle it and then just like pirate it. So I have no problem fighting AC1. I have it on my laptop right now. Like, you want to stream? Like, you, give me two minutes. I'm going to find this on Pirate Bay. Like, we we have no problem with that in here. Try playing our modern hardware. <laughs> Is it the PlayStation 5 can't play Syndicate? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, since you guys are talking about PCs and, and different consoles, um, let's talk about the way games have changed because I know now, like, I'm not a gamer really, but my husband loves to play games and so does one of my one of my kids. Um, they just, 
download new games when they come out. Like they don't really even go to the store anymore and buy any sort of physical copy of that. Do you think that is a good thing or not such a great thing when it comes to maybe the quality and the, I guess, playability? Because you guys have talked a lot about how it's the same parry, block, stab. Like there's not a lot of creativity. And is that because they've, you know, gone to this digital format or just kind of the nature of trying to get things out there faster for the consumer. Would you like Garrett to, to start with? Sure. <laughs> Garrett looks like he's contemplating very hard. Yeah. Um, I I think a lot of it is down to the fact that they decided to try for a few years to do an annual release cycle for the series, which is, I, I've always think it's come to the death now of quality unless you've got like four or five studios working on it. And that's the, that's the only reason that the Call of Duty games come out every year and they're not completely terrible. Um, but also they're basically the same thing over and over again. So, so there's, but obviously a Ubisoft are a smaller company than Act. Activision work because I guess they don't really exist anymore. How you know, Microsoft things come through, but that's for another podcast. Um, so yeah, because that's what you were left with basically is that if you're if you've got this constant development cycle, there's not enough time really, I would say, to to come up with anything particularly new or interesting. You're basically just iterating on what's gone before. Which is definitely what's happened with these last ones, even though they've actually I think they've gone back to like a two year cycle or a three year cycle on them. Um, and they've now decided that they're going to split it up. There's going to be two two tiers of Assassin's Creed games now, because Mirage is going to be shorter and more like the old ones, and they're going to keep making these weird epics as well. But they're going to be like another shoot of the Assassin's Creed games. So they've even kind of, so Ubisoft have sort of. Um, Realised themselves that they were actually making two two game series and a lot of the old fans and like new ones. So yeah. <laughs> uh, to answer to your question, uh, I think you know, like uh, the digital format is just cheaper. I mean, I think where I live, we like let's say cascade behind the world a little bit. You know, like we're just trying to catch up and. I don't know, you mentioned Blockbuster. I know what it is through popular culture and stuff. We did not obviously have that in here. We had like, you know, some guys who turned their sheds like and they, you know, pirated the games and CDs. Though That was our Blockbusters. So I think, you know, just they, they go around with the time because uh, in a digital way, you people can download it from your server in... Uh, in a hard copy like CD, you have to have factory for CDs. You have, you know, to get their data to factory, which will all probably also be digitally. Or uh, then, then you need to have a distributor. Then that, you know, general distributor distributes to countries distributors. Then shops buy from distributor. It's so much, and that's that's why, I mean, deflation deflation is eating up. But if you look around, the the, the prices. Of the games haven't actually changed and they should be you know like cheaper now but if you go back and see how many hands does a cd you know like go through it's it's only normal to expect why why does it cost like you know like 50 60 bucks i haven't paid for a single game in my life i have to tell you that like that was like not nah, a chance like you know like we were uh, the, the 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 normal you know wage in Montenegro for for that time was like 250 euros a month and they're like we're not giving you like 50 euros for a game you know like so you know we had to you know get smart and you know know your stuff around around computers so yeah but I don't think it's it's related to you know like the the, the game game style that you said you know block parry and stuff I think it's just you know like um there was a shift in, in generation, like it, it they called it next gen, next gen of, of gaming, and they like tried to forcefully, you know, go through something that everybody was comfortable with. They made the media drama about it. Oh no, we are re releasing the next gen game and stuff, and they just, you know, made something that's not 
for me, it's not like sticking, you know, like I was so disappointed, not only in AC to, to be understand, but even in the other games that have like similar, similar style of playing, especially combat. And that's why, you know, like I'm playing old ones, I'm playing League of Legends, I'm playing War Thunder or something, you know, like, like that. It, the, that next gen that, that was announced, it did not fill my expectations at, at all. Like it was just, it's, it's a possible error. It, it this this will have to pass and then we will probably have to you know like have some interesting gameplays at at one point of 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 our lives or you you hope you hope the cycle will come back to <laughs> yeah we're creative it it would be nice gareth where do you where do you want the future of the assassins creed franchise to go are you in favor of it going back to the beginning, back to its roots, or do you think it just needs to do something different? I just need to end it. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> <laughs> All good things must come to an end. But I, I don't know, like, this this new one that's coming out looks like a step in the right direction, but it does also look like the trying to sort of have their cake and eat it too so it's I like if this is the way the series is going to go because this is clearly like a tester to see if they can kind of run both of them at the same time uh, personally I would much rather have a really good 20 hour game than a massive map that I'm never going to explore half of and a game I'm probably never going to finish so yeah, I would prefer it to go back to the way it was. It was more story driven. It was more focused. It had more character of its own. It didn't feel like a, a kitchen sink. So yeah, thinking it back is is probably the best thing we could do for it. I wouldn't end it. I wouldn't end it. But the problem with today is like we all live in capitalistic, you know, societies, and it's obvious. Like we can, you know, like pretend it's not like that and we can you you know just keep our mouth shut but it's obvious you know that the gaming studios are just you know putting out the content just to earn money like back then the 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 how do you say the market was different and you and they had to you know like work hard make some good games you know make it for four five years six years it does not matter i think that the production of the first one began in 2002 or 2003 and they released it in 2007. So you can see how many years, you know, is in the game. And, you know, it was completely different and so on and so on. But today, they're all on that next gen, you know, principle. And, you know, as much as you can, just put it out, put it out. It, it's sort of like, you, you know, like new smartphones. Because you have like basic format. Then you have like a pro plus Pro plus plus and you know like so why didn't you just give me like the pro plus 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 and call it the normal like well why why do I have to know you know like buy the normal and one month later you know you're killing me with the new one so it it, it it's like that I, I I feel like that I don't know I mean I don't think you're wrong necessarily I think entertainment in general I mean because we could say that about movies and the fact that they keep remaking movies that don't need to be remade i agree yeah and people keep covering songs like you know musical artists keep doing that and it's like just come up with something new we're happy to wait and we would actually pay for something that was good if we waited on it as opposed to you know training people every year to look for the newest and best because it's not always the best yep i agree i mean I understand the musical artist because, you know, like, um, uh, we call it um, autors copravo here. Basically, it's like copyright law and mm -hmm. uh, it dictates that um, you actually can't buy. I mean, I'm talking especially now about the songs and text. You actually can't buy it like you cannot buy a text or, you know, like uh, music. You rent it like for 10 or 15 years, I don't know, on, on our land, it's like you rent it for 10 years. After that, like the, 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 the original creator can resell it because you do not own that, you rent it. And I'm not sure what's up with the movies because 
the movies, you know, like they do own label, like George Lucas owns label for owned. Actually, it's Disney now, but doesn't matter. He did own, you know, like, and that it, it's treated like a company, you know. So basically, uh, it can't be, you know, like nobody can take, uh, you know, the the brand name of Kiss because they they do have a brand on it. But if they bought a song from somebody, yeah, I know Gene Simmons, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, I. But if they bought a song from somebody, after ten years, you know, like, and general terms, ten years, like the the song can be resold. Like that, so the, it it's different with with movies and and songs and stuff because you have to you know like think a, a movie franchise as a company, and uh, like uh, a song or stuff like that as a product. Like mm -hmm. we have yeah. that's why we have like so many brands of telephones. And first was Motorola. Nobody bought Motorola, but they made something like similar. Like they made the product. Similar, and that's why we have so many brands of, of phones today, or we had them even more in 2010 or something like that. I I look at in 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 that way. It, it reminded me of that. So, would you? Uh, sorry, I'm going to switch topics completely because I, you know, people who are listening to this podcast may not be as super fans as of you guys or of Assassin's Creed as you guys are. Um, so if they were to uh, want to play it, what would you compare it to? Is there anything on the market to compare it to today? The old ones are similar to Prince of Persia, definitely. The, 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 the first couple of ones. And I can probably relate to Splinter Cell due to like stealthy parkour stuff. But I'm again, I'm talking about the older ones. Mm -hmm. The new ones, I think that the Garrett will know much more about them than, than I will because, you know, like. The new ones are like The Witcher 3. And that's why it's the but worse. <laughs> yeah, but worse. Just buy The Witcher 3. <laughs> Just buy that game. It will take you forever to finish it. And you won't care because it's brilliant. But. The, that's that's basically the the thought behind the newer ones was to turn it from like a pure action game into something that was more like a role playing game, um, with all the pointless stat grinding on top of it and all the rest of it. It it's kind of a microcosm of a lot of the worst practices of the industry because there's a lot of like microtransactions and oh yeah, that makes them pay to win. Yeah, pay to win and manufactured discontent so that you, you know, you're inclined to to buy the little boosts and stuff that they offer you so that the game, you know, smooths itself out. It, that's probably the worst part of them is that there is, there is a good game there. It's just covered in so much corporate nonsense that it just wrecks the experience. Can't pirate it. <laughs> pirate <laughs> This is all unlocked. <laughs> all unlocked. <You're> advocating breaking <laughs> on the Wealth of Things podcast. <laughs> it's not breaking the Montenegrin law. We don't have that in our law. <laughs> Come Montenegro. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> um, that makes a lot of sense because I feel like that's it's the same for. I mean, you could think about that for streaming services. If you want ad free, you got to pay more. If you want, you know, uh, so stupid, like the closer seat like... at the movie theater, or maybe not the closer, the best seat, you you can pay more to reserve that one. Should what was it? Was the middle aisles now costing more money? It's stupid. <laughs> it's interesting. I I don't I don't like it, but then in some ways I do because I appreciate like I can show up five minutes before the movie starts and I know I have a seat, but. Do I want to pay more for that seat? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> Every, like everything is lost just points. I mean, we're talking, you know, games, movies, streaming, service, but even, you know, like the simplest, you know, like phone apps, you you have like, you know, like pay to 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 pay to to not have like any distractions and stuff. I, I played like top 11 football or you guys call it soccer manager like uh, on, on that and I, I installed it like, I don't know, 10 years ago when I was with, with my, you know, friends in high school and it still exists. And I redownloaded it 
couple of months ago and from, you know, like a game which was like a mobile football manager, which was cool. It's all pay to win. You like need training boosts. You need like tokens and stuff and just like delete it. Goodbye. And, you know, like can, can, can do it. Well, why would I waste money? I mean, it, the point of it is to be free, you know, to be entertaining. They earn enough, like from distributors, they earn enough, you know, like from advertisements, from, I don't know, the, the, how do you call it? Promote promotions and stuff. They do earn. It's like, it's not like, you know, they're broke and we have to finance them. Like they do earn and it's like billions, billions of dollars, euros, francs, doesn't matter where, where the, the, the company is, is from and then pounds also, Gareth. <laughs> Come on, man. Not that I was anything anymore. <laughs> so yeah, like it, it's just not, not enough. Like you know, like imagine if we are recording podcast and you 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 say it after like forty five minutes, guys. If we if we want to keep recording, you need to like Venmo me ten bucks or stuff. Like it it, it <laughs> it's like that. It just doesn't. It's it's not cool. No. So, Gareth, let me ask you this because we kind of talked a little bit about you said you wanted to you were like, OK, Assassin's Creed just needs to be over. We're just kind of we're done. So what would you do in its place? Because I feel like the people who like those kind of stories and are maybe those kind of storytellers building the video games are still around. Maybe they're just being stifled right now in favor of corporate greed. Um, what well, could yeah, they should make something new? <laughs> Well, they did. They could kind of. Well, they would be then free to do if they ended it. So they could make more historical epics because obviously there's a market. So the main people like playing historical games. Um, I really like playing historical games. It's probably part of the Assassin's Creed I like the most. But like, then they would be free of kind of all of the convoluted shackles, if you will, of the story that's kind of got bogged down in itself over the years. And they could just make that game because there would be no animus anymore. You could make the game the Alexa wants <laughs> where you're just in the past. Just let me, let me, let me play. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could, you could, I mean, there's, there's plenty of, you know, fables, classical literature yeah. out there, you know, myths, legends. So much material. You know, it doesn't need the framework anymore, I don't think. They could just make a game about Rome. They could just make, you know, there are games about Rome. There's like Total War and stuff, but, you know, they could make another one where you are just in the Roman Empire as, you know, somebody trying to get by. They could make a, a half decent Viking game. They could, they could make one about, you know, something else <laughs> yeah. you can make stuff like, like australia you could go anywhere you know so it's, it's basically limited to what stories people want to make and the thing about assassin's creed is is it's not i think the thing people love about it is the history and the exploration and you don't need the assassin's creed part and the snickety snicked blade and the the blokes in hoodies to, to kind of make that and i i think it could just end and they could just go away and they could make something else different instead i mean the guy who started the series left ubisoft years ago anyway so it's not even really the same creative force at this point hey alexa i know you said you didn't want it to end <laughs> yeah but if you could if you were someone on the team that was helping the direction of the Assassin's Creed story would you end it and start something new so you could be fresh or would you where where would you take it well it depends if, if I'm a decision maker you know if if, if uh, the team would want to continue on the road that they're on now I probably would not be on that team because I want to you know like make a game which I will play like and mm -hmm. there is like just zero passion in that if, if I'm making something that I won't play. I mean, I understand what Garrett is saying and it does make sense after many horrible games that, that uh, they made that it's, it's normal for a person to say, okay, guys, just like stop it. 
But for me, the, the Garrett says like uh, you don't need like the hidden blade and Assassin Creed part, you know, like to 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 explore. For me, those parts like keep it together and keep it like connected. I mean, I know Sarah, you didn't play, but you know, like the assassins are called, they are recognized by hidden blades that go in here, and that's like that that that's making makes them di distinctive, and it's all about that. It's like constantly, you know, like. Um, constant fight between good and evil but you never know which is good and which is bad like templars are in the most of the series bad but then you have like a uh, rogue assassin creed rogue where you actually play as a templar and that is like completely unknown like you played everything as an assassin and then you have a game where you are actually templar and you are killing the the the, the protagonists which you played like in last games, which were your friends, which were your family, your teachers, and then you like go and, and, and kill them. And you, you cannot like, you don't have like a possibility of decision. Like I won't kill him. No, like you have to kill him or like just turn off the game. So yeah, it's, it's, it's constant balance. And that's what, what made it interesting for me at, at one point. But what but what Garrett says, I have to agree. I mean, if even if they decide to to finish it, there is so much material. I mean, they uh, they already you know like stepped into like paranormal with the paranormal artifacts and stuff. So that like opens doors for witches, vampires, werewolves, aliens, and you know like if you if you started with with something which is you know like not possible, which is paranormal and magical that uh, and people accepted it then like it's it's like you know you can do everything now just make it good i i would be the first one you know to to play uh, with with a vampire or, or a witch or or well werewolf it, it doesn't matter but there is uh there is uh so much uh so much to explore and if they want to keep it uh you know re relevant to history as they did now they can incorporate it like they did incorporate Jack the Ripper in uh, Syndicate. Am I right, Garrett? And they incorporated. Yeah. Uh, Charles Darwin turns up at one point. Yeah, I mean, they have Washington. Or you got like Sir. Leonardo da Vinci in the second one. Oh, that was great. Don't touch that. Yeah, that was quite good. So you had your own rates. I was <laughs> kind of fun. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's... it sounds to me like both of you really would prefer a game that was historical in nature and relevant to things that we all know and have learned maybe from our history books that have actually occurred, but then maybe have this little bit of the fantastical element that started, I mean, the 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 concept of Assassin's Creed is pretty cool. As someone who didn't play that game, but kind of knows about it because I have somebody in my family that plays it, and also because of the movie, I, even though I didn't see the movie, I saw enough of the trailers, I understood what was happening. That he wasn't actually like he was being transported to the past by this device and i think that concept is really cool but seems like you guys are saying that their creativity is lacking now <laughs> i think it's zero like dried out like they're just making the same game with different maps all over all over again <laughs> he agreed good work Yes, Gareth quietly said pretty much, but he did say <laughs> it left his body like he did not want. To. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, you know, I did say at the beginning of this episode that I was going to pick a winner in the debate. But really what you guys just did for me was kind of educate me about Assassin's Creed and its history. So I don't really know that I have any sort of winner today because I think you guys just did a really great job of explaining why Assassin's Creed is so popular, has been so popular for a long time, and what they could do to either, I don't know, if you want it to survive, what they need to do to change it, or if they just need to stop and start again. So huh, maybe someone's listening from the company and they could take your advice to heart. <laughs> or, hire, or hire someone to take us down, like. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Sure, lots of lovely, lovely. 
So before we wrap this podcast up, since we are talking about responses, we want to give everyone an opportunity to respond to any comments that they agree or disagree with. So Gareth, will you let everybody know how they can find you online? Uh, I'm on X or Twitter or Elon Musk Fantastic Playroom, whatever it's called now, at WASDUK1. And I am also on Instagram at Gareth Newnham. And uh, that's about it, really. And Alexa, where are you online? Basically, I'm online on, on, on Instagram at the jelly t h e d z e l e but it's basically what what you know like i can i can communicate with that the, the twitter was too much like for me even even a few years ago so but they can all all find me on 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 belt of geeks and and comment below the video and stuff I, i'll i'll That's check right. it out they sure can this will be on youtube and you can also leave comments on any of your favorite podcasting apps if you want to respond to anything these two guys have said today. If you loved what they had to say, if you didn't love what they had to say, <laughs> we will take all comments. Do keep them PG. <laughs> Please. But I want to thank you both for being here today, and hopefully we'll see you guys on another episode. It's great to be here. Thank yeah. you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Bye. That's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the Wealth of Geeks podcast and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We have a ton of incredible content coming your way that you're not going to want to miss. Until, Until then, then, stay geeky. geeky.